Glad that you're not going to be there. Ain't he scared? Ain't he? All right. Yeah. Well, he's. Uh, well, he just goes to tell you. Goes to show you how much he likes you. Uh, okay. Now then, uh, on this electronics thing, what we're going to do? I'm going to uh, whip through some of this stuff here, and I've got my. Uh, I got the questions here, and we're going to let you guys, you know, soak up this as you go. And now, you, this is not. This does not release you from reading a chapter in the textbook. Okay. If you want to get this thing, if you want to be ready at the end to take your ASE test, which book uh, is it? My talk is right. the electronics book, the one that's got the yellow car on it. But, uh, if you guys, if you guys are wanting to soak up the uh, electronics and, uh, and be able to pass that part of the ASE, you're going to have to not only listen to what I say, but you're going to have to read what's in the textbook as well. Um, and what I don't want to do is, uh, you know, have you feel like, well, I've, you know, done. I mean, soak up everything you can because everything that you learn, every worksheet I give out is going to be structured to teach you something. Every page in that textbook is going to teach you something you can. And there's little uh, blurbs in there about actual real world fixes and stuff like that. And that textbook is written by a smart guy. Most vehicle manufacturers today don't network their electrical systems through computers. That's absolutely false, isn't it? Okay, uh, what is a network? What are you talking about? What are we talking about when we talk about a network? System. There was a time. There was a time when every sensor was hardwired to every computer that it was talking to. In other words, uh, the computer, the, the engine controller would have a speed sensor in the extension housing in the transmission, and it would be wired to that. The anti-lock brake system would have brakes, uh, wheel speed wired to the and like brake module, and then they finally they started doing some stuff that was sort of like networking. That in the back in the early '90s, Ford had this sensor in the rear end, and uh, the sensor in the rear end that was telling the uh, it was the only speed sensor on some of those trucks. And what it would do, <laughs> they had an instrument cluster that had it had a needle on it, but the odometer was a little liquid crystal affair. And what that would do is it would take that signal. And it would receive the signal from the rear end. Well, the ABS module was always hardwired to, the, to that sensor, but it would also branch off and go to the uh, uh, piece. I mean, to the instrument cluster, and the instrument cluster would send it to the cruise control as a separate. It would refine that signal and modify it, send it to the speed control, and then it would also send it to the uh, you know whatever else it might need, depending on you know the system. So that's a networking deal where you've got they got smart LAQ. And they decided, let's just take our wheel speed sensor and let it go. And we're going to take that same information and send it to the cluster. We're going to send it to the cruise control if it's got a cruise control module. And we're going to send it to PCM. So basically, you'll take a whole bunch of wires, and you'll see this illustrated sooner or later. You've got modules all over the car that have different jobs to do. And I'm just going to draw six of them. All right. And you'll have a DLC connector here where you plug your scan tool in. And you're going to go to every one of those modules with the same wire. Right? And all of the information that's coming in to one of the modules is going to be fed out to the other ones. See what I'm saying? To give you a little example out of some of this stuff works. we got smart components now. Like on your uh, Power Stroke Diesel, you know, the... Uh, the one that came out in, you know, they had the variable geometry turbochargers on it. Uh, what that thing would do, the, the common rail thing, uh, it had a little uh, supercharger, I mean, a turbocharger controller. And it had a special cooling system. It was specially for it. And so let's say that the PCM called for, it would talk to this little uh, controller and it would say, I want some more, I want you to change, increase my turbo boost. And this little box right here would say, Unless you turn on that coolant pump and send some coolant over here and cool me off, I'm not doing nothing for you. Okay? So in the, in the PCM say, okay, my bad. I'll turn on your pump. So these boxes are talking to each other. That's it. And they've got <coughs> controller area network. But, you know, the, the speed of it uh, is is important, too, to remember. You know, because the, the controller area network bus is actually going to be uh, the fastest when they got two different speeds of them. they got... You know, 500 kilobits per second and 82, uh, you know, 100 kilobits per second, all that kind of stuff. 
or 82 kilobits per second. Now, that's not kilobytes, that's kilobits. So you know the difference. We're in electronics now. You know the difference between a byte and a bit. What's the difference between a byte and a bit? Yeah, that's smart. But there's a usually, on, a, on, a, on the average, there's 8 bits to a byte. Okay? So when we're talking about kilobits, people out here. I said, uh, that's Oh, that's the man. Come on. Yeah, you got a visitor or something out there. Number two. Number one. That one there. Yeah, that was ready to return the requisition for your. Month, month, month. Well, uh, your, this is the last Tuesday of the month. That's when I was talking about. Oh, all right. All right. Tell, a visitor, tell a visitor to stick their head in here. So any information that needs to be sent to one place can be sent to any other place in the car? Yeah, it's, as a matter of fact, the same, nowadays the way these buses are set up, y'all listen up now, Wes. Uh, the information that goes uh, on most of the cars now, uh, you may have two or three different networks. But on, on a given network, all of the information is available to every module. But the module only uses what it needs. See what I'm saying? It can use anything. And your scan tool, when you plug it in, becomes a module. You see what I'm saying? Howdy. All right, so did you need to see me for something? Yeah, I wanted to see about getting a blower motor put in a 94 kilowatt pickup truck. Okay. Give me a little time because right now I'm in class. And we'll, uh, you know, come back in about an hour and we'll talk about it. All right. All righty. Thank you. All right. And, um, okay, so now let's go down here. Neutral safety switch is used on vehicles with an automatic transmission. True or false? True. Yeah, it won't start us as in part, right? I mean, or neutral, right? Um, but uh, what you got now is that not only do you have the, that switch on the side of the transmission, some of those on the newer, really newer ones, the transmission computer is built into that switch. <laughs> It's an aluminum thing with fins on it and all that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the transmission computer is part of that switch, but the, it looks like just a neutral safety switch, but it's got a computer in it. So uh, that's that's fun too, isn't it? Okay. A charging system is used to restore to the battery and the electrical power used during engine starting. Charging system is used to restore to the battery the electrical power used during engine starting. That's true. Yeah, I mean, wh whenever you use power out of the battery, where does it come from? Oh, no. Yeah, all, and it's a charging system, right? Okay, these are true false questions. Or some of them are no brainer right now. The vehicle lighting system only includes the lights on the exterior of the vehicle. Uh, there's other stuff. There's other stuff besides that, isn't there? Yeah. Okay. So number five, the vehicle instrumentation systems monitor various vehicle operating systems. Duh. You know that's a truebie. There. That's about there. Okay, number six, power mirrors are considered an electrical accessory. Yes. All right, most vehicles today contain one powerful onboard computer. Oh. Yeah, that's false. There's a lot of computers on the vehicles. You may have uh, anywhere from 20 to 100 computers on most of the cars that are today. Let me pause for a second to say that. Uh, how many of you guys know what an F-35B joint strike fighter is? It's a plane. It looks like an F-22 but it hovers. If you've ever played Battlefield 2, you've flown one, okay? <laughs> if you've ever played Battlefield 2, you've flown one, or Battlefield 3. But anyway, this is the one that looks like a Raptor, but it takes off vertically. And uh, you saw the you saw Die Hard, the last Die Hard movie that he made, yeah. where they, that guy got after on that Raptor. Daughter off the little building back? Yeah. No, well, that's actually a Harrier. That's a jump jet, but it's, it's an older jet. But the, the F-35B is a computerized joint strike fighter and it uses six million lines of computer code to do the stuff that it does. It's got little guns in the wings that shoot uh, 100 rounds a second or something like that. I mean it's really something else but uh, a Ford Fusion uses now think about this. Let me look at the numbers. Let's look at the numbers here. All right, we got six million lines of computer code F thirty five B. A Ford Fusion uses two hundred and fifty million lines of computer code. Yeah, that's a lot. Now the the fighter plane is more fun to watch and more interesting to see, you know, and uh, the stuff that it does is pretty cool. But it doesn't have to satisfy mission requirements and all, <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. And it doesn't have quite as many amenities. But the, the computer code that's necessary to make these new cars work is astronomical. 
Now, that's not anything you're going to have to actually type and understand computer code. Don't get me wrong about that. But what I'm saying is there's a ton of computer knowledge, of course. It takes more computer code to run a Ford Fusion than it does to run a jet. Yeah, that does. And uh, the, 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 uh, this one guy that had worked in the uh, aircraft industry, you know, working in the military, working on uh, fighter planes and stuff, uh, said that the, uh, the electrical system on a modern automobile is equal to or greater than what you would find on a fighter plane just because of the number of wires and the stuff it's got to do and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and I'm not taking it away from the fighter planes. There's a, tech, there's a heck of a lot of stuff somebody that's working on a jet has got to know that we don't have to know. But they can't use an impact wrench and we can. See what I'm saying? Ta-da. That's pretty cool. Isn't it? All right. Now then, let's look in here to, um, let's see, the use of automatic passive restraint systems is federally mandated on all passenger vehicles sold in the United States after 1990. After 1990. That's actually true. And one of the passive restraint. Uh, now, how many of you guys saw a passive restraint system that wasn't an airbag? Pass, not all passive restraint systems were initially airbags. Uh, some of them actually had a uh, seat belt that would work automatically. That was not very popular. My wife had a 93 Tempo that Wait, had that. Are you talking about the thing that like chokes you? Yeah. Remember, you close the door. You close the door. Yeah. Door door yeah. I had a Mitsubishi Eclipse, and it wasn't that bad. Yeah. Well, what happened to my sister, she uh, had a little 88 uh, Escort, and she opens the door. Well, she's reaching for the she's reaching for the drive through thing, and she can't get to it. And so keeping her head out the window, she opens the door and the seatbelt goes oh! and then she pulls back and stretches it on its inertia rail and when she closes the door, it comes back and wraps around her <laughs> This was bad news. <laughs> I mean, but I mean, that's kind of stuff. My wife, she used to fight with that thing. It would get her purse and try to take it away from her. She hated it, you know. And those things went away. People, they stopped putting them on there because they were just too much trouble. We had to work on those things when they quit working. We had to put new tracks and Oh man, you'd be glad you didn't fool with that. Anyway, yeah. Uh, I hate about it when they get stuck right here on the back mm -hmm. and you can't get your hand back here to unbuckle Well, some of them, they actually had it where you could unbuckle it from the door, but the problem with that was people wouldn't buckle it up. They didn't drive without it. But anyway, uh, Ford Model T was the first people's car. And uh, now that's, that's, that's true. It's actually the one that just anybody and everybody could afford. Um, do, you know, uh, do you know how much it was that you, uh, now Wes, you need to read the chapter too, buddy. But uh, but you know what the um, uh, Henry Ford said you could make the uh, you could get a Model T in any color you wanted as long as it was black. He didn't think cars ought to be no color but black. Wow. Uh, he just didn't. He was just a strange guy. You I know. thought he was just too lazy to paint them himself. No, I, no, he actually started a. Model, I mean, what they would do at the River Rouge plant, uh, all of the raw materials, piles of stuff, you know, would be in one end of this plant. And Ford bought nothing from nobody that was, I mean, they made everything. And as a matter of fact, I had read somewhere that Ford Motor Company is the only company in the world that still make, that makes their own glass. The really? automaker that makes their own glass. Didn't they revolutionize the assembly line? Yeah, they did. The assembly line. And i tell you something else they did. They, when, during World War II, they changed their assembly line over to build bombers, and they were building like 8,000 bombers a month or something. They were doing incredible stuff with the assembly line. And that's that's one of the reasons we, were, we won World War II, because of all this assembly line stuff. And Yamamoto told the Japanese, you know, people, he, he was the admiral of the Japanese fleet, he says, we're not going to uh, be able to beat them unless we do it quick, because they did really, they really do well. Let me see if this is an enrollment thing here. Hello? Hey. Okay. Matthew Winters. Yeah. All right. I'll send him over. I'll send him over after a little bit. All righty. Yeah. She says she's got your books now. All right. So anyway, um, tires are not involved with any computer system. That's false. That's absolutely false. What computer system are they involved with? I don't know. Huh? Tire pressure monitor. Think about it. Now, what are the tire pressure monitor? What are those sensors in the tires that give you your tire pressure to talk to? I guess the part of No, the keyless entry. Oh, really? Because of the radio. They're already radio. Uh, <laughs> if you got something that's already doing radio, why not just let radio handle that? You know what I'm saying? Technically, wouldn't the uh, 
a speed sensor to be or anything that involves the, uh, say, if you change the tires out with a different size and it affected that, well, wouldn't that technically be in? Yeah, you've got a good point. And I will tell you something else. On some of the some of the cars, uh, well, I think it was some of the early Ford cars, instead of having a sensor in the wheel, they would use the wheel speed sensor. And if that wheel was spinning faster, they would know that it was low on air because <laughs> it was like a smaller wheel. You see what I'm saying? Because a, a wheel that's higher that's low on air is going to turn faster than one that's full because of the you know radius of it, I guess. I mean, it's, it's kind of screwy, but they actually used that and made it happen. You know, so... You wouldn't think of it that way, but it worked. Uh, uh, number 11, let's go on. This is multiple choice here, or multiple guess, if you want to call it that. Alternate propulsion vehicle systems may include all of the following except what? Yeah. yeah, hydroelectric being, what would hydroelectric be? Water power? Yeah. Yeah, that would be water powered vehicles, I guess. Uh, technician A says most manufacturers, what is hydroelectric? Yeah, that's like water going under a wheel, right? It's making it turn. Technician A says most manufacturers network electrical uh, systems together through computers. Technician B says network system. A fault in one component may cause several symptoms. All right, who's right about that? that a lot of people hate these uh, multiple sleep, choice questions because it's like sleep. two questions in once. Sleep. That's going to be a that's going to be a C. Uh, the principle the automotive horn operates by, wow, that's cool. How, what makes your horn work? Does anybody know what makes your horn work? Uh, that's it actually going to be uh, electromagnetism, isn't it? we got some smart guys over here. The thing about diaphragm? Huh? Or the defense current about diaphragm? Yeah, there's a diaphragm in there, but there's electromagnetism. This makes it work in 13. That's going to be a C. 13 is going to be C. Okay, 14. Ah, oh, now this is cool. Let's talk about this for a minute. The seat recall position on most memory seat systems is only allowed if what? It's in park. Huh? B. That's going to be in a uh, B. It's in park. Okay, let me ask you this. How does that work? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, what's, what happens is it, uh, it fires up. One day there was this guy that was a salesman named Randy Bruner. And he, I saw him pull this Explorer. I was leaving my service by walking out to get a car. And he, real quick, he pulled this Explorer just inside the fence going to the service line. He parked it, and he left the door open. He jumped out, and he ran around there to t- say something to somebody. And, uh, and I just, <laughs> I came by there, and I just ran the seat all the way forward. I mean, of course, some of them things, I don't know why they make them. That way, but they'll run forward where the seat almost touches the dash, you know. And so, uh, anyway, I was kind of watching him over my shoulder when he came running around. He went right there, and he tried to jump in that thing, and he bounced off the dash. <laughs> and he's looking so confused, like, how did this happen? You know, I mean, it wasn't dangerous or anything, because he just had to run it back so he could get in it, but it's funny as all get out. But, <laughs> but I mean, I could see that he was, he said, he was like, wait a minute, it wasn't like this when I got out of it, you know. Uh, now then, um, oh, I was going to tell you how the seat recall thing works. Um, whenever you do the memory seat thing, right? Okay, so every motor, how many motors are there? Like well, at the very least, you got one that goes up and down, another one goes forward and backward, right? Maybe one for lumbar control or something. Yeah. 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 Well, you remember what, you, what did I, what did y'all see on the scope while ago when we were running that fuel pump? You saw little, little bumps, didn't you? Okay, so what you got is you got a smart little box, and it actually is going to remember where that motor is. It's going to remember where it is, exactly where it is. And when somebody gets in there, let's say that Wes gets in there, and he says, my gosh, Brandon Ballard's going to drive this thing. I can't even reach the pedals. And he said, I'm going to have to move the seat. And he goes, eh. And so the little box says, whoops, he's moving the seat. Let's count the bumps. So it counts the bumps. And it remembers what they were. All right, And then Granny gets in here, or Brandon, or whoever, and they match their fob. And it says, okay, driver number one's getting back in. Let's go back to zero. And so if it went 14 bumps on this motor or 24 bumps or how many it went and eight bumps on that motor, it'll move back to zero. So wherever you set it, it's ze- that's zero. And that's its point of reference. It's going to go back there, you know, to where the person. So, you, so what you're going to do when you're setting those up, you set it where you like it and you push the button and the memory module says, gotcha. Now I know where that is. And it has got a better memory than we do because it remembers without fail how many bumps it moved. Well, I bet if the battery died or something, the 
And as battery dies, you're going to lose that stuff usually. Unless it's in a kind of memory that's called non-volatile memory. And that non-volatile memory is memory that's not erased. Like, what would there be an example of that? Like a memory on the flash drive? Internet. That's a memory on the flash drive. Well, no, what I'm talking about on your car. Okay. Give me give me something else that uses uh, non-volatile memory. Like, huh? What about that odometer? You don't want to take the battery off and zero your odometer every time, do you? I mean, you may zero the one that you can zero, but not yeah, the one that... Yeah, law if you reset it. Yeah, you like, like a smackdown. I know, but uh, anyway. Saturn and the one on it just stopped. Yeah, yeah, they do that. Technician A says a neutral safety switch, blah, blah. Yeah, that's, that's, an, that's easy. That's easy. Everybody knows that. Number 15. I don't know why they keep talking about neutral safety switches. 15 is an A. Hey. Everybody knows that. You got a clutch switch on the other ones. Um, there was a, a clutch switch is important more so than you think. Uh, and I'll tell you something else, how, how fast you can get injured in an automotive shop pretty seriously if you're not really careful and you're not really paying attention. Uh, to begin with, when you put a car on the lift, you need to do it right. But secondly, uh, I tell you what, I was working at the Volkswagen place in Enterprise in 1983, and I pulled a rabbit. Whenever I pulled a rabbit in there to work on a Volkswagen rabbit, I would drive it in there, and most all of them little suckers were a stick. And I'd leave it in neutral. Why would I leave it in neutral? Because I like to be able to move the car around and get it where it's right on the lift. See, it was always in neutral. Now those cars didn't have a flex switch on. You start, you just reach in the window, start it up. All right. So my uh, my car, they had a they had a door right here, and there was a wall. The service manager's office was here. The parts window was here. And so when I pulled in, I would pull in onto a lift right here, facing that wall. Now, on the other side of that wall was this, this lady that worked in the office, and then there was this showroom out here and all this kind of stuff and everything like that. All right, and so what happened was Eddie uh, pulled uh, this other guy who was, you know, helping the service manager. Thing. He pulled a car in on my left. When he pulled a car in, he didn't put it in neutral. He put it in, left it in first. Whatever gear it was in when he stopped driving, it just got out of it. And um, so I did all my work on it, and he says, Wait a minute, you were supposed to set the idle speed or whatever it was, too. I said, oh, crap, I forgot about that. You know, because it went, I didn't I hadn't even had the car running. I was doing some, I did some other work and it was static. And because I was so used to, you know, to it being in neutral when I pulled it in, because I was the one that usually pulled it in, he pulled this one in, I started the car up and it ran into that wall. And, uh, and it pushed the wall, it, it pushed the concrete blocks out of the wall. And there were file cabinets on the other side of the wall. And the file cabinets go, <laughs> and the woman in the office goes, ah! Oh! <laughs> but I mean, so we backed it up. If somebody had been standing in front of it, it broke both their legs. But he was standing to the side, and it went right into the wall. I mean, before you yeah, could do anything, that car started real fast, real easy, and it just took off and ran right into the wall. Now, it didn't have a lot of time to build up momentum, but it sure shoved that wall in. But did you know it didn't make a scratch on that car because of the way the bumper was made? I mean, not a single scratch. You couldn't even tell it did nothing. It didn't hurt the car. It screwed up the building. It didn't hurt the car. But, I mean, see, the thing about it is it's always best to check it every dead gum time you start it, even if you know you left it in. Because somebody could have got in there and bumped it with their knee and knocked it up in gear, you see. But that's just the word of the wise. You know, before you know it, you can get hurt. Now, I have not known of a lot of people getting hurt in shops over the years. I mean, you can get something in your eye. Usually, something in your eye, you can cut yourself on a sharp piece of metal. You can burn your arm when you reach up by the manifold. All that kind of stuff, but the same about it is. Matter of fact, I got a burn on my right there, but I did that working on a lawnmower. But uh, anyway, um, I hate working on a lawnmower when it's time to cut the grass, don't you? I don't mind working on a lawnmower if it ain't time to cut the grass, but if I got, I want to cut the grass, I want to be done with it. Don't mess up. All right. Get me an electric lawnmower one of these days. All right, now then. Hmm. Vehicles equipped with automatic traction control systems. Uh, de uh, let's see, what do they do? Do they deactivate the system at speeds above 50? No. Increase the uh, output torque of the engine to move the vehicle. Automatically speed up the wheels that are too slow or automatically applies brakes to the wheel that's spinning. D. That is a D. A automatically apply brakes. Have you guys ever had a vehicle on the left like a pickup truck or something? You know how they got park brake cables going back to the back wheels, right? They got park brake cables. Okay, so when you fire this thing up, let's say that you're wanting to take your stethoscope and you got it on the lift. And you're walking around under it, the drive shaft spinning, stay clear of it, don't get your don't be wearing something loose around your neck that can get caught up in there and pull you into the drive shaft. All right. You're gonna take your stethoscope and your but now the right hand wheel's spinning up a storm and the left one's the one you're wanting to 
you know, listen to it, right? So what do you do? You grab the park brake cable on the right side, and when you pull that, it applies the brakes, and it forces the differential to send engine torque over to the other side. That's how you do that. You pull this one, it makes that one. You know, what the any lock, I mean, the traction control is the same thing. And it actually it says, okay, I got it with the wheel speed sensor. It tells it, I got a wheel spinning on the right side. I'm going to apply a little brake over there. And the other one starts pulling, and you pull off. It's kind of like having electronic positive traction. And, you know, that police car out there has got positive traction on it. It's got some clutches in the rear end. All that's not electronic. But uh, Judy McClaney's uh, had a Pontiac Montana she used to drive. And when she would go to drive off on that thing, sometimes the traction control, even on dry pavement when nothing else was going on, she'd go to drive off and the traction control would go blah, 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 blah. And she would get a traction control light on the dash. Okay, so how do you troubleshoot that? It's up to you. you got to find out what's wrong with it. Well, the scan tool on it, what do you do? Hey, you're right. That's right. That's a good answer. What next? Yeah. The yeah. Well, first thing I actually did was went to Identifix and saw if anybody else had had that problem. Not a bad idea. Didn't find anything there really. So we're going to plug a scan tool in. When we went to drive off and it did this stuff, the right hand wheel, for some strange reason, even though it was rolling at the same speed, the left hand wheel, it was reading 22 miles an hour, and the one on the left hand was reading like two miles an hour. Speed sensor, the speed sensor was fouled up in that. Huh, for some, I don't know what would cause it to read speed that wasn't there. That's a really an anomaly, but it worked. I mean, that's what it was. We put a hub bearing on the right front and all that problem went away. I wrote a Motor Rage article about that one, by the way. On the right front? Right front, yeah, because it was a front-wheel drive. You know what I'm saying? Um, okay, all of the following statements about an airbag system are true except what? The active system meaning what? Yeah, but it's always working. Yeah, you, well, no, active system means you have to do something to make it work. Smack something. I mean, you where I'm going? Yeah. So you don't have, have to do anything to make an airbag work. You have something that goes off by itself. Yeah, it goes off automatically without you having to do anything. Anytime you talk about something that's passive, right now your, your passive anti-theft systems are such that they've got the chip in the key. When you turn on the car, the key is actually... Red. I mean, it reads the key, it's so it knows. Yes, got it. It shakes hands, and it knows. There's a, it reads that number, and that number is actually sent to the module. The module says, "Yeah, I know that key." Boom. You know, here's a funny story about passive anti theft. Uh, just real quick, uh, Donnie uh, Hughes over worked on this uh, guy's GMC, I guess it was, or Jeep Cherokee one. I can't remember which. Anyway, the guy gets somewhere after Donnie did something to it, and he says. I'm trying to start my car, and it won't start. Now, sometimes that system locks the starter out, and sometimes it'll start, but it won't, it'll spin, but it won't fire, right? On a Chevrolet, it likes to, you know, give trouble because of the ignition switch and all that, and it, 20 minutes later, it will start up. They, they're smart enough to where it's going to keep somebody from stealing it, but later on, you can still start up and go on. GM pretty smart about that. Anyway, this guy says, I'm trying to start my truck, and it won't start. And he says, uh, Donnie says, look at it, Dash, tell me what you see. Uh, I don't know how he figured this out, but Donnie's pretty good about figuring stuff out when somebody's talking to him long distance. He says, what do you see on the dash? Do you see a what looks like a key with a line drawn through it? And he says, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do see that, and it's flashing. He says, you got something going on with your key. And the guy said, just a minute. And then he says, wait a minute. And Donnie said, mm-hmm. heard it start up. He said, what would you do? He said, well, I never knew this. But the key for my Jeep will actually spin over and spin the starter on my GMC. <laughs> it just happened to have the same cuts. And so he stuck the wrong key in there, and it spun the starter. See, if it hadn't moved, he'd say, well, it'll have the right key. But it just so happened his would spin the starter. I've seen that kind of thing before. Uh, yeah, there only so many key patterns in the world. But some of them are bound to be Yeah, that's right. What? Over, over at school, we had to do lock his keys in the Chevy. I think it's 1500. Yeah. And a dude with a Nissan opened door for him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I used to see this this guy, this one guy that I knew would stick a key in on one of these cars that was the same make, and he'd jiggle a key and he'd move it a little bit, jiggle it, move it a little bit, jiggle it, move it a little bit, and a minute it'll, you know. No, isn't he? he just threw off the door. Yeah, yeah, right. sometimes that happens. But door. It's doable, you know, I've seen that. Um, okay, uh, active system. Excuse me. Uh, Technician A says most manufacturers now use a system of vehicle communications called multiplexing, and Technician B says multiplexing allows control modules to share information. Multiplexing allows control modules to share information. Hello. 
Is that right? What? The one I saw about before. That's what multiplexing is. You got that? So number 18. Number 18 is going to be C, right? Technician C would be both A and B. Uh, most manufacturers use multiplexing, and technician B says it lets them share information. And that's what we described there. Right? The purpose of vehicle multiplex system is to do what? C. Well, A actually compare computers to, I mean, allow computers to share information. And that reduces the amount of wiring, supposedly, or reduces the amount of sensor. Well, that, um, number 20, and we're going to jump to the next test after this. All the following are true. Uh, of the easy exit feature of memory seat systems. What's easy exit? It Anybody? backs the seat up so you can get out. Yeah, it, it may move the steering wheel and move the seat so you can get out. Uh, how many of you remember 66 Thunderbird? It had an active uh, easy exit system. You know what happened? This is no joke. The steering wheel would move over. Donk. I mean, the steering wheel would actually break over from the, whenever you switched it off and you're ready to get out. The steering wheel would just slide over to the side, right? And it would just kind of be over the console. You could get out real easy when you come in and click and put it back in place. I read one of those, but I've had vehicles with removable steering wheels. Oh, yeah, that's right. I mean, that's a, that's a racing car thing, too. Yeah. You know. but, uh, well, I'll, no, I put them on a lot of street cars. You can. Them. You know, I've, I've seen them on street cars. It's hard for me to get in and out of a car. Yeah, yeah, but sometimes, like, when you're trying to climb out of your Dukes and Hazard style car, it's easier if you just pull the steering wheel off, you know. All of the following are true of the easy seat feature, uh, feature except... What? I'm sorry, easy exit feature. Except what? A, the system may move the steering wheel up. Well, it can do that. It's an additional function of memory seat systems. The driver's door is open automatically. I don't think so. You don't want that to happen, do you? Why is it that they uh, have it, uh, the, uh, well, let me hit you with this. Um, if I've got a doggone, um, Let's see. Uh, what's his name? Raymond that we had here. He had to pull the transmission out of a uh, 96 Blazer. Puts it back in. Now the guy's saying the hatch won't work. You know, the electric hatch release. And so I said, well, I don't know how we could have anything to do with that. Well, it turned out we did. Because when Ray plugged it back in, he didn't plug the transmission range sensor back in good. Everything else worked except... The, the ground for the hatch release goes through the transmission range sensor. Why would they do that? They don't want you opening it when you're driving down the road. Yeah, if it, yeah, if you lose kids, ice chests, pets, all kinds of stuff that way. You know what I think about that? Uh, my tailgate come off the truck mm -hmm. and rip everything out the back. Did it do that? It really did on my truck out there. I had to get a tailgate. <laughs> I just fixed that not That's too long ago. mine. Because I chose to uh, Jerry read the existing one against your uh, advice. Yeah. And then uh, later on I found out I didn't have four-wheel drive. <laughs> I didn't have no reverse lights. The back latch thing wouldn't work. And uh, the little shift indicator would not always be there. It was just there and sometimes it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you ain't got a new sensor put on there. You ain't got that to your That was in his Tahoe that he was working on. Random question. I just want to know. Mm -hmm. What's the most expensive car you've ever worked on? I don't know off the top of my head. What's the most luxurious car you've ever worked with? Well, I mean, you know, Lincoln's and Cadillacs, but I mean, you know, probably, I don't know, probably, uh, it would have probably been a Cadillac or a Lincoln, I don't know. Cadillac I haven't done anything to a Ferrari, and I haven't, maybe a Porsche, I mean, I've worked on those, you know, but, yeah. but uh, anyway, but that's something like that. According to Ohm's law, we're going to test two now, guys. Diggle, opened up your test two. Okay, we got to blow through. And I'm sorry about this, but because some are so short, we got to blow through two tests every time we we meet. And we're going to try to do it quick. So but some of the stuff I tell you is stuff I won't, I won't, you know, you won't get anywhere else. Huh? What? What's number 20? Number 20. Does it open the door automatically? All right. According to Ohm's law, what's the resistance when one volt pushes one amp of current through a conductor? One watt. What? Resistance. What, what resistance? All right. Everybody knows what this is, right? Triangle. E. I. R. One volt pushes one amp through one ohm. This is volts, this is resistance, and this is amps. Now, why they put E and I there, I don't know. I don't like the way they do that. But if you take this and multiply it times that, you'll get that. Give me an example of that. 
Watch this. Okay. I've got three amps, four ohms, 12 volts. Got that? That's the hour. Remember that. If you know what two of these are, you can determine what the other one is. Got it? Remember that. That's what, and sometimes they draw a circle to do it, but this is what I like to do it right here. All right. 12, 3. And if you multiply that time, that you'll always get that. And if you divide that by that, you'll always get that. See what I'm saying? You can always do a little triangle there. Well, that's, a, that's the way that works. The technician A says the total amperage in a parallel. Oh, and by the way, volt times amps equals watts. Right? So it's B, Te right? Yeah. Technician, yeah, that's basically a B. Technician A says the total amperage in a parallel circuit is equal to the sum of the individual branch circuits. Now, don't get confused on that. We're working through this stuff pretty fast. But if I've got B plus and I've got B minus, excuse me, B minus, B minus is going to be hooked to ground. Okay, now then, I'm going to go, and everybody's got their own ground. That is parallel. Right? If I burn one of those bulbs out, the other ones will still work, right? That's a parallel circuit. Okay, so now let's look at this. Technician A says the total amperage in a parallel circuit is equal to the sum of the individual branch circuits. Look, two amps, two amps, two amps. How many amps that circuit pull? Six. Six. That's what it's talking about, right? Technician B says the amperage in a series circuit is the same anywhere in the circuit. Looks great. Here's a series circuit. Just the Hancock. That's the light bulb. Like um, Alright, now then. If I measure the amps here and here, am I going to get different readings or the same readings? Different. No, they're going to be the same. Uh, it's a loop. Darn. Got that? Parallel? No. Because you're only going to measure, if you measure it on the parallel, well, let's go back to that. This is, a, this is I'm doing this really fast, but it's, I'm trying to do it in a way that you can understand it. All right, I got four light bulbs here. Two, 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 two. Let's see, two amps. We're not going to make it complicated. All I've got on the ground. Eight. If I measure it here, what's it going to be? Eight. It's going to be eight. What if I measure it here? Four. See that? See how it changes? What if I measure it right here? Two. Two. You got that? That ain't complicated, is it? So the bulb's only pulling off two amps. Yeah, you're only pulling off, you're only reading the, the legs that you got there, you know. That's the thing. All right, so that's how that works. That ain't real, that's not a big deal. It ain't complicated. You don't have to feel like you're being beat up by it, you know. All right. Let's see. Hold on, let me get my back in. I can type the right password in. Okay, now then. Uh, let's see. So number two is what? Two is actually uh, C, isn't it? That's that. Okay. What is the sum voltage? Sum of the voltage drops in a series circuit equal three. Hey, What's your five seven? Uh, probably in about twenty minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. What's up? We're back. All right. All right. Uh, the sum of voltage drops in a series circuit equals what? Source voltage. Hmm. The sum of the voltage drops. Now we know what a voltage drop is, right? For the one of you that don't know what a voltage drop is, uh, let's do this again. B minus ground. All right. Now I got a circuit, right? All right. All right. And I'm gonna put a switch right here. Okay. Now with that switch closed and those lights burning, mm -hmm. you're gonna be Measuring your, if I wanted to measure the voltage drop, let's say that that switch had dirty contacts and it really wasn't, you know, carrying the juice like it was supposed to. I'm going to take a meter and I'm going to measure it right here. Whatever I'm losing across that switch because of its bad connection is going to show up there. Let's say two volts. If you got 12 volts here and you got two voltage drop here, you're only going to have, yeah. However, if you got a series circuit there, you're going to drop. Five here. If these bulbs have the same resistance, then five here. So you're going to drop two, five, and five. And that's going to equal what? Four. 
Well. Got that? That ain't complicated, is it? You understand what I'm saying? Now, when you measure it, now, where does it, what does this do for you in the real world? Remember what we talked about. You take your voltmeter and you put it in the center of your battery terminal, positive battery terminal, and you put it on the post going to the starter, and you have somebody spin it over. If you're dropping three volts there, that means you're only going to get, if you've got 12 volts coming from the battery, you're only going to get nine to the starter, and it's going to go rah, 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 and you, now you know you got to clean some connections. Got that? That's what voltage drop's all about. Voltage drop is extremely important, easy to understand, but often forgotten. Most mechanics won't even measure voltage drop. There's a charging system voltage drop, too. You know, the big wire that comes off of your alternator? You know, everybody knows you got an alternator, you got a big wire, and that big wire ultimately makes it to the battery. That big wire ultimately makes it to the battery, one way or another. It's going to go to other places. It may go to the starter and hook up down there. It may go to a junction block. But that is supposed to go be hooked to the battery with a good strong lead. If you take your meter and you hook it there and the positive side of the battery, and you need like three volts there, then that means that this alternator can't get what it's putting out to the battery because it's being lost on the way. Got that? You usually see some heat and some blistering and some scorching and some oxidation wherever the resistance is, or you may not, depending on where it is. But anyway, that's the charging system voltage drop. You got that. You got the starting system charge, and then whenever you, uh, we use voltage drop to our uh, <coughs> advantage by, you know, your fan speeds. Low speed, medium speed, high speed, you're dropping most of your voltage on low speed through that resistor in the lower housing, right? Got that? Okay, so what does the sum of the voltage drops in a series circuit equal? That's going to be a C, isn't it? The source voltage. The source voltage being whatever's in the battery. Did I make that plain? plain? You got it? You picking this up? All right. I mean, this is accelerated, right? We're accelerating this learning here. We got we're, we don't have a lot of time this summer, so I got to pack it in as hard as I can. What is the formula for Ohm's law in which E uh, equals I? In order to, what do I call that? E equals one. I mean, I equals E times R. Is that right? No. Nope. Nope. E equals I times R. No, not really. You're going to have to divide some of the time, Wes. Think oh, yeah. about it. That's going to be a B in there. We talked about if you multiply I times R, you're going to get E, right? That's in our that's on our little pyramid. Yeah. You know, remember you remember the E hour, E hour. Remember that E hour. You need to be able to draw that, and come up with it. What will adding resistance to a series circuit cause? Less current, Less current to flow. Number five is going to be a B. What is voltage drop? A, voltage used up when pushing current through a resistance. Current used to go through resistance. Electrons used to go through resistance. My goodness. What a question is that? That's what we just talked about. Eight. Easy as pie. Huh? Number five was actually the, uh, it, it's going to have, uh, when adding resistance to a series circuit, it causes less current to flow. Think of yourself stepping on a water hose. You know, the pressure that's on the water hose is actually the voltage. And what's flowing through the water hose is your amperage. And when you step on it and pinch the hose, that's resistance. You got that? All right. Uh, and voltage drop is voltage used up and pushing current through. Okay, in a series circuit, which of the following statements is correct? Uh, the circuit amperage will increase as more resistance is added. No, that ain't right, is it? The total resistance is the sum of all the resistances in the circuit. What you got? All right, number seven. What you got? That's a B, isn't it? But you know something? The total resistance is less than the lowest resistor. It is not. I mean, that is true, too. But the uh, answer, according to the people that wrote the book, uh, they screwed that up. C is actually true. Let me explain what I'm talking about. This is important that you guys know this. Okay, let me say if I've got... I saw this on a test. First time I saw a question that was a trick question like this was on a test in 1986. In, uh, where was I? Atlanta or something like that. But anyway, I got resistors. That's well, a resistor is supposed to be drawn like that. All right. Now then, they're all tied together. All right. 
Okay? And I've got five, three, and two. Those are the resistances. All right? Now I'm going to measure the resistance of that circuit with my meter. All right? And you've got, let's say it's a multiple choice question. Okay? So we say A, we're going to have 10. B, A, C, 5, or D, what? Huh? It's going to be D. How's it D though? Because you've got 10 volts right there. I mean, 10 ohms. ohms and then you have two, right? Uh, why, why do you, how do you get one? All right, I'll show you. It always has to be lower. It's going to be lower than the last, least one. All right, here, look at, think of it this way, Wes. I've got a bucket, and it's got water in it. And I've got a lot of resistance and be a little bitty hole. A little less resistance will be a slightly bigger hole. A great big hole would be like the one ohm. This is a 10 ohm hole. We have a 5 ohm hole, a 3 ohm hole, and a 2 ohm hole. So you've already got all this water flowing out the 2 ohm hole. Now you've got two other holes, and it's flowing out even faster. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? That makes sense? It's another place current can go. So it's got to be less resistance. You can actually tie a bunch of resistors together and prove that. But yeah, that's just that's just the way that is. It's going to be less than the lowest every single time. Now these are not in series; they're in parallel. You got to recognize they're in parallel <coughs> because I mean I can I can get certain amount of current through here, but I can get even more through there now because I've added two more additional tracks for it to go on. Yeah, think about the holes in the bucket. Ain't you got me? I mean, let's say that you're gonna you're gonna lose uh, like it's a two ohm. You're going to lose an ounce of water every second for every, you know, size hole. So I'm going to lose two ounces here. Okay. Right. Okay, now right there, I'm not going to quite lose two ounces. I'm going to lose like maybe one ounce. Mm -hmm. And then right there, I'm going to lose a fifth of an ounce. So not only am I losing these two ounces, but I'm also losing what's coming out of these two holes. So it's just more places for current flow. Yeah, but I mean, I, I, I thought I thought it'd be two though because you get. Well, no, you've got it. It's like you got some more holes. You got other places it can go. I mean, like see right there, you got you got a certain amount of current going through here. Plus, you got you're additionally have things going through these two. You're just adding more paths for it. The more you put, the less resistance you got. This is always to it. Generally, it'll take the path of least resistance. Yeah, it's going to take a path of least resistance, but it's some also going to flow through those other ones. It's going to reduce the resistance of the whole thing. Now, if it's in series, you multiply. But the way you figure these dadgum things, you got to actually multiply, and then you got to divide to get those. And there's a you go look, you're gonna see that in your book. It's gonna talk about it in the book. But uh, if you, you got to understand that that you that every time that you've got, you know, all of your dash lights that light up your dash. I'm talking about the ones that illuminate your dash. Are they in parallel or series? Series. No, they're in parallel because every one of them is getting the same amount of voltage. If you measured the total amount of resistance of all of those bulbs, you know, you'd probably come up with something very small because there's so many of them bulbs in there. See so, what I mean? But if you took all of them out except one bulb, you'd have a pretty good bit. See? So every time you add another bulb, you're going to get less resistance to the circuit because it's providing, and it's going to do what? It's going to pull more amps. Every time you add another bulb, you're going to pull more amps, aren't you? Right. I mean, so I add another resistor, you're going to pull more in. And which, so if those resistors are rigged up parallel, then they'll be less. But if they're rigged up in series, it'll be more. Yeah. If you, if you line them up in series, you'd, add, you'd multiply. I mean, you'd, you know, you'd, well, I'm sorry, not multiply, you'd add. Oh, okay. You know, five and three and two. But see, I got them in parallel. Okay, I guess. So. Yeah. See, because okay. they've got all in place that go. But it don't have to go through all of them, you know, stacked like it does in, when it's in series. You know, maybe I didn't explain that. Well. Yeah, you just said that now, now Yeah, parallel. Think of think of it as a parallel circuit. That's why I did that right there. You could, uh, anyway, I need to I need to come up with a board to illustrate that. Mm -hmm. um, what's voltage drop? Voltage used up? Let me. What what, what number am I on? Eight. Eight. Hey, excuse me. All of the following statements about voltage drops are true except what? A voltage can be measured with a voltmeter. That's true. B voltage drop is the conversion of electrical energy into another energy form. Ooh, that's interesting. Uh, what what other energy form would it be? 
Heat. Heat, big time, yes. All right. All of the voltage, even on a light bulb, you're dropping your voltage, but it's getting hot. Burn yourself touching a light bulb, right? All of the fall, all the voltage from the source must be dropped before it returns to the source. And corrosion is not a contributor to voltage drop. Are you kidding me? Of course, can, uh, you know. And a lot of times, what will happen is if you got a lot of current flowing through there, and you know these uh, relays and stuff, it's got these blade type terminals. When you plug them and unplug them, a lot of times they may get to the point where they're a little bit looser than they should be, and then they start to oxidize a little bit, and then they start to drop voltage. And as they drop dark voltage, they make heat. And as they make heat, they melt things, and the more they melt things, everything snowballs. After a while, it just quits current quits flowing. Um, sometimes what we'll do is we'll hit an overloaded circuit. Somebody, you see these people will take these pickup trucks, and they'll have light, they have lights that they want to put on the running boards. They'll have lights up here. They'll have lights here, there, and you'll have a line of lights across the back. And they they just daisy chain all those lights together in parallel. And the brown wire that's going back to your tail lights, they want to just scotch lock into it and pull all them lights with it. That's a recipe for a disaster. Because what happens is they come in and say, now none of my tail lights work. And you say, okay, let's look and see what's going on. So you pull the instrument cluster out. You get the uh, headlight switch out because, you know, you're looking here. And the headlight switch is melted into a mess because they got too much current. It's made to pull like 20 amps at the most, and they've got like 35 amps on it because they got lights all over the place pulling off that same circuit. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. If I've got a situation where um, this doggone... Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, she'll slap a taste out your mouth. Yes, yeah. All right, we'll get you going up. But, uh, yeah. But, uh, read the chapter, Wes. I will. I'm going to ask you some pointed questions out of that. Don't neglect to read the chapter, okay? Ours is chapter one, right? Yeah. Well, no, chapters one and two. One and two? Yeah, one and two. Yeah, read them. Um, and, uh, and and if you got any questions about that, uh, that uh, Mike will be able to tell you about anything you want to know. All right, so... All right. Uh, Michael's the guy he works for. See you, Wes. All right. So uh, he's got a speech class that sort of stomps on a couple of his other classes here. Okay. So um, corrosion. Oh, this one guy scotch locked into a wire harness to pull his boat lights. With a, you know, scotch locks the little thing you just push down there and it bites into the wire. And he hooked that son of a gun up and it uh, burned the whole daggone wire harness up on that Thunderbird. $3,000 repair. So what would be the right way to do it? How was he pulling a boat with a Thunderbird? Well, he just had a little fishing boat. You know. He's in his with a boat on him. Yeah. And the boat didn't, the little boat that he had didn't have a on front, but he burned them trailer lights all night long. I don't know where he was going. But what happened was it started melting that wire. It didn't blow a fuse. It just started melting that wire, and that wire melted into other wires, and it went all the way up under the dash over there, and I had to pull the dash out of the car. I had to pull all the trim out of the car and replace every wire harness in that car. That's why whenever I put floodlights or something on a truck, I always run them straight to the battery. Yeah. That's not a bad way to do it, but I'll tell you the right way to do it. This is, this is cool, too. You guys can appreciate this. You see that thing right there? That's called a relay. Here's how you do that. Well, I used a wire with a fuse on it. You got a coil. You got a, that's good. It's not a bad way to do it. You got a coil. You're coming off of this relay. I mean, this, this wire right here. All right. You're going to ground this coil on your relay. This relay is an electronic switch. All right. Da, 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 da. All right. Now you're going to come off of your fused battery with this. You have a fuse coming off of your battery. I'm not talking about you're not going into this wire. You're going directly with the battery. And then you're going to take this to your lights. What happens then? Your little bitty 20 gauge wire or 22 gauge wire, whatever it is, is going to cause that relay to go click, and that relay is going to carry that battery power straight to your lights, and you ain't going to burn up nothing that way. It's the way to do that. Got that? That's what a relay is all about. And that's what a relay looks like. That is a relay right there. See that relay? There right there. See this? Call, call, common, normally open, normally close. See on the board? There's one right there. All right. Now then, what's the amperage flowing through a 36-watt bulb in a 12-volt circuit? Three. Wow. Point. 36-watt bulb. In a 12 volt circuit, what's the amperage flowing through it? 3.3. Anybody confused on that? Remember, I said volts times amps equals ohms, right? Okay, so let's take 36. 12 divided by 36. Yeah, it is what? Um, it would be 3. 
Three, big time. See there? See how quick you figure that out? That's B. Number eight. What was number eight? Uh, number eight was actually a, a D. You know, that's a, a, that answer is you know, Okay. We're getting there. Technician A says when a magnetic field moves across the conductor, voltage will be induced in the conductor. Remember what I told you earlier. Magnetic field moves across the conductor. You're going to make, make it. All right. Technician B says when a conductor is moved across the magnetic field, voltage will be produced in the conductor. There. Both those guys are right. See? If I took that little wound up piece of wire I got out there and hooked a voltmeter on it, and I, that voltmeter is connected to it, let's say I connected it with some flexible wires, and I got one of these great big massive magnets that comes off the bottom of one of our trays, and I run that connector by it like this right here, you're going to see that voltmeter go all over the place. That's how your alternator works, right? Okay. Now then, uh, take. Huh? Now the Bofums. That's number, number 10. They said, they said the same thing. Yeah. Say it again now. I thought y'all went to 11. Or 11 was 8. Yeah, that's what I said. Technician A says an atom that loses or gains one electron is balanced. Technician B says an atom that loses or gains one electron is called a charged particle or ion. You guys learned that in science class? That's B. Technician B says an atom that loses or gains one electron is called a charged particle or ion. Hey, you coach, Technician A says testing with a voltmeter can determine the voltage drop across the headlights. Technician B says voltmeter can determine if excessive resistance is in the circuit. Who's right about that? That's C. Both those guys are right. Uh, how many how many amps does the headlight bulb pull? Twelve. Fifteen. No, that's a little too that's a little high. Twelve. No, amps now, not volts. Uh, five, about four or five, maybe six, if it's really high. In a closed circuit, oh, and incidentally, let me tell you about the fuse thing. Um, let me bring my this here, uh, Sean. Let's say I've got two headlights, and those two headlights each pull six amps. Right. Well, let's, say, let's, let's make it a little easier to do with math. Let's say they pull five amps a piece. Okay, what kind of a fuse should I put feeding those headlights? I mean, what size? No, because it'll blow the fuse when you turn it on. Five. Why? Because the current surges up and then it levels out. 20 amp. Fuse. Yeah, 20 amp, 15, 20, something like that. You got to have it so that the fuse can handle the surge when the lights come on. Why? Because the resistance in those bulbs changes when they're burning. And we can prove that. Gets I can show you. Once they, huh? Once they start burning, it lowers down. Well, it actually, yeah, lowers the current flow. So if a bulb that's got 1.5 ohms. When it's cool, when it's not burning, will you check with your meter? We'll have like six ohms when it's burning. It's going to change with the heat, okay? And that makes the bulb positive temperature coefficient. Remember that term. Because your coolant sensor in your car goes exactly the opposite way. The resistance in the coolant sensor changes. The one that you got in the water that's telling the computer how warm the engine is, it changes, it gets the resistance goes lower as the temperature increases. It's negative temperature coefficient. So you're going to hear that term again. That's why I'm th throwing that at you right now. Uh, in a closed circuit with a capacitor, will, when will the current stop flowing? Okay, A, when the voltage charge across the capacitor plates becomes less than the source voltage. This sounds complicated, doesn't it? B, when the voltage charge across the capacitor plates comes equal to the source voltage. C, when the voltage charge across the capacitor plates comes greater than the source voltage. Or D, when the voltage charge across the capacitor plates becomes equal to the resistance of the plates. 13. All of the above. That's actually B. Um, now, how do we know this? Look, when the capacitor is full, it's not going to absorb any more voltage. Is it? I mean, that's all there is to it. And what is a capacitor anyway? A capacitor is a battery. That's all it is. It's a battery. Do I have a capacitor in here? I'm not sure. I have one here. If you throw a capacitor, one that comes out of a, a fluorescent light place. Well, there's probably a capacitor in there. But what I was thinking about for our automotive purposes, you know the set, the condenser that's in a set of points? Mm -hmm. That condenser is actually a capacitor. And what you can do with that condenser is you can charge it up with voltage. Well, like for instance... I can take a little capacitor, like you might radio shack. You know, a little capacitor is a thing. There's a bunch of different ways they look, but a lot of times you'll see it. It looks like a little cylindrical thing, 
and it'll be blue and it'll have a little stripe on it like this and it'll have a minus on one end usually. And basically if you put power here and ground here, uh, this capacitor will become charged up with whatever you put in there. All right, so then you take your power away and that capacitor, while you're holding it in your hand, it's got 12 volts in there. And then you can take an LED and you can just pick an LED. And if you take an LED, you know, an LED, you got a long lead and a short lead. Read, you seen those before? Little light emitting diode like this right here. Light emitting diode, you see you got a long lead and you got a short lead right there. All right. Now the long lead and the short lead, if you took the long lead's positive. Can you remember that? Long lead's positive on an LED. When you're hooking an LED up in a battery circuit or something, you always have to put a resistor in series or you'll burn it up. Just remember that. Okay, but if I take my little capacitor, you're not going to burn the LED up like this, and you touch it so that the, the long lead is here and the short lead is there, this capacitor, I mean, this uh, LED is going to go boom. Now, the capacitor doesn't hold its energy very long. It's an extremely short life battery, but it can absorb voltage spikes and all kinds of cool stuff. That's on your condenser. Whenever the points close on your condenser, that capacitor discharges into the ignition coil and helps saturate it faster. That's why if you've got a bad condenser on your car, I don't know where to flip if you're using points. Uh, anyway, if I'm going too fast for you, don't worry. It's all in the book, okay? So remember, I'm only going to see 12 volts in here. If I put 12 volts to this capacitor, it's going to go up to where it's got 12 volts in it, and then it's going to stop. You're not going to be able to create voltage out of thin air like that, you see. But, uh, so always remember that. I can take a, the condenser out of the distributor and lay it on the engine block. You know, the one that's got the little wire with a terminal on it, and let the ignition coil go pop, 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 and jump and hit that little uh, terminal into that thing while the can's laid on the engine block. And now that sucker's got 30, 30 to 50,000 volts stored in it. And if some yo yo grabs a hold of it, it goes, whoa, whoa, you know. So, I mean, that people throws you a condenser across the shop, you just need to let it fly by, you know. Because if you catch it, it's, you know, bam, like a bright blue flash, you go, whoa, you know. So, I mean, that was an old trick that people used to do. And if you got one that's a good one, somebody would lay it down somewhere and just wait for some yo-yo to come by and pick it up because they're going to touch the end of that wire. Bow, ah! You know, <laughs> it's like a time bomb waiting to go off. Now, a bad one will drain off and won't ever do that. I'm not, I'm not advocating doing anything like that. But that's just to deal, illustrate how that capacitor, if you've got a good one, it can hold that power you know, indefinitely, pretty much. Now, where, Until, where would I find one of these in the shop? <laughs> Look at him. <laughs> the actual, uh, in that distributor out there, that on that uh, right. board, you'll see a condenser on that distributor, right. but it does not need to be removed. All right. Sure. Uh, the display of a di digital voltage oh. ohmmeter is indicating 236 millivolts. Which of the following is the same as this value? A, 0 0.236 millivolts. Okay. B, 0 0.236 volts. Would that be right? That's a B. Technician A says the amperage is the same at any point in a series circuit. Technician B says the total resistance is the sum of all resistance in a series circuit. Well, we talked about that earlier. You measure the amperage anywhere in a series circuit, it's going to be the same, right? Because it's a circle. All right. You don't have any branches coming off of it, right? Technician B says the total resistance is the sum of all resistance. That's right, too. Uh, so technician A says the conventional theory of current flow states, current flows positive to negative. He's right. Technician B says current flows randomly. Who's right about that? That's A, current will flow randomly. Electronic theory says that current flows from negative to positive. Why do they say that? Because electrons, you remember you were saying in school about atoms? You learned about atoms in school? Uh, electrons are charged how? Positively, Positively or negative? negative? Negative, that's right. Electrons are negative and protons are positive and yeah. neutrons are neutral. Pro. Yeah. What if you don't have, what if you've got more, uh, what if you've got more, uh, what if you don't have a neutron? I mean, what if you don't have a proton, but you've got electrons? Yeah. Well, you're basically, if, if it's unstable, like hydrogen, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to explode. You know, you got... All right, so it's real easy for oxygen to unite that. Okay. When oxygen unites with it, you got an explosion. Um, and you got water, too. Uh, three 10-ohm resistors are wired in parallel. What's the total resistance? What I show? What did I show you guys up here? No? Nope. What did I show you? Three 10-ohm resistors are wired parallel. Just one. 
¿Ves? Mira. Este. Ten, ten, ten. All right. Got a list there. There's, there's, there. They're all ten. Ten. All right. So I'm gonna measure it like that. What am I gonna get? It's less than the lowest. I'm gonna say it's, it's a third of that because they're all just alike. What's a third of ten? Three point three. There you go. A tail light bulb is glowing dimly. A voltmeter placed across the bulb reads four volts. <coughs> Hmm, across the bulb meaning what? You got ground feeding the bulb, you got hot feeding the bulb, you got to look across those, you're reading four volts. You ought to be reading what? Ten. Twelve, I think. Twelve. You know? Whatever whatever in the circuit. Uh, technician A says there may be excessive resistance in the ground circuit, technician B says there may be excessive resistance in the power feed circuit. Who's right about that? Either one of those guys could be right. Either one of them could be right. Because if you're gonna have low voltage there, it could be in the ground, it could be in the positive. You don't know which. Uh, and you know, how would you determine that, by the way? How am I going to do that? I got my meter here. I'm going to do it. I'm going to hook up to the battery, and I'm going to go to the ground, and I'm going to see if it reads 12 volts that way. If it does, I'm going to park a problem on the other side. Then I hook to the ground and go to the positive side. I'm talking about directly to the battery. So to start with, you're hooking up across the bulb. So here's your bulb right here. We're just going to draw this real dumb and simple. Got two terminals there. Actually... You know, you got one, this is grounded on most bulbs. But let's say, let's assume that on very, ever so often you'll see one that's power and ground. I hook up right here, I read four volts. All right, what if I go to my battery? I know this one here is plus and that one's minus. I go to battery, B plus, and I'm going to hook there and I'm going to measure right here. If I see 12 volts here, I know my problem's on this side. Got it? If I, and then I'll, I'll figure out what is going on in that side. That's just the plain old electrical stuff. Technician A says voltage will not exist between any two points in the circuit if the potential is zero. Right? He's right. That's number A. Technician A says power is found by multiplying voltage times current. Technician B says power is expressed as wattage. And that is C. Voltage times amps equal current. All right. All right, you guys. You are really a bunch of troopers in here. And I really appreciate that. And now, what we're going to do, we're going to try to concentrate on our um, electrical worksheets. Matt, they got books for you over there. I'm going to get you some books.